Hello and welcome to the debate on Talking Europe. I'm Armand Georgian in the European Parliament in Brussels. Well, the war in Ukraine has forced a major rethink of European security with further enlargement of both NATO and the European Union now on the table. Kiev has asked for a fast track procedure for EU membership. Moldova and Georgia, feeling vulnerable, have also applied. The EU has made it clear that Ukraine belongs in the European family. But admitting several more nations would be highly challenging, not forgetting the fact that before the war, the EU was already negotiating with candidate countries Albania, the Republic of North Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Turkey. Well, to debate, to debate how far the EU should grow and how fast that process should be, I'm joined by two MEPs, Sophie Innertfeld, Dutch MEP from the centrist Renew Europe bloc. Welcome to you. And also Mark Tarabella, a Belgian MEP from the Group of Socialists and Democrats. Welcome to you as well. Um, so let, let's start with a question of Ukraine's European future. Just before I do that, I'd like to set the scene with this report from our Spain correspondent, Sarah Morris, who's been following Ukrainian refugees arriving in Catalonia. In the town of Guisona, one out of every seven residents is Ukrainian. This bus has arrived in Gisona, in Catalonia, carrying about 20 Ukrainian refugees. They're on the way back from the police station set up in the next town. Under the European Temporary Protection Directive, they've secured a residence permit in Spain. A huge relief for Hannah, who arrived in the country a few days ago with her daughter. Thanks to these papers, I'm going to be able to integrate in Spain by finding work. I hope to really contribute to something to society, and I'm really happy and grateful to be here. In the last month, 266 Ukrainians have arrived. The vast majority have a relative here. In Gusona, one out of every seven residents is Ukrainian. The EU has mobilized 17 billion euros to help member states welcome refugees. But this mayor feels abandoned. There's been zero support from the institutions. We had set up a bank account for voluntary donations. We've raised 30,000 euros so far. That allows us to run the bus to the police station. Backed by the town hall, the Ukrainian community is helping welcome their compatriots. Mikola has lived here for the last 22 years. He has turned his shop into a distribution center for basics. Look at what we've managed to collect for the refugees. There's children's clothing, bedding, fresh vegetables. This is all based on goodwill. We need more funding from European countries. This has had to become my main job. I only have a few hours free from it to keep up my business. Little Ukraine, as Gisona is dubbed, expects to receive dozens more refugees in the next few days. Sophie Interfeld, what do you think, what sort of future should the EU offer Ukraine now? Well, I think this is the right moment for, uh, let's say, an overall strategy for the enlargement of the European Union, which should cover Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia and the countries uh, in the Western Balkans. Uh, and I think we should offer them a real perspective of EU membership. Of course, not today. They will have to fulfill the criteria like anybody else. But I do think that we need to rethink the process because a process whereby countries are kept in a waiting room for 10, maybe 20 years is just, it's asking too much from people. And at the end of the, the process, then the, the 27 current members will unanimously have to decide to let them in, even if countries have made all the necessary reforms. I mean, that's what we should have is a kind of um, phased uh, procedure. So maybe a first phase whereby uh, a number of chapters, negotiating chapters are concluded uh, and then that country will get, for example, speaking rights, they can have observer status in the European Parliament, which we've had before with the other countries. Maybe the next stage they could get, uh, they could get voting rights on some issues. So they're, they're sort of phasing in. It will make it more rewarding for people to implement all the reforms. What do you think of that phasing in idea, Mark? I think that 
The fact that, of course, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia want to be integrated in the European Union, we have to be proud of that because uh, they want to, to have the same model of democracy. But we have also, to be frank, uh, maybe to give a signal that, OK, we open the discussion, but the decision will be long. Why? Because to be integrated in the European Union is not so easy for them because they have, for example, to adapt all their law that we already have voted in the European Parliament for the 27 countries. And of course, it's a long process. And I think that the proposal of uh, Mr. Macron uh, to have a community of European community uh, to, to begin the, the dialogue is a good proposal because uh, I share also what say uh, Sophie Inzelt, that is a long process. And you know, when people have now 20 years, they are 20 years old and they have to wait 20 years to be integrated, maybe it's too long. But it will be long and we have to be frank on that because uh, I think that we have to, to say that clearly to Mr. Zelensky, for example. What about giving them, as, as Sophie in a felt saying, is giving them some voting rights along the way to make them really feel part of the process rather than just waiting and right at the end saying, OK, now you're members. But the former country that uh, integrated, uh, for example, in 2004, some country, 10 countries, uh, were considered as observers in the European Parliament. Uh, and they, they participated to the debate, but they didn't vote. Mm. Yeah. Why not? Uh, to have uh, um, um, some enlargement on a political uh, in, in the European Parliament. Mm. It's easy to do that. Also, with a community, but I think that they, they, ha they will not have the same right as the member state mm. uh, at the beginning the, of the process. I just it's want to impossible. unpack this idea of the political community and then, and then I'll, I'll come to you, Sophie. Just, let's take a quick listen to President Emmanuel Macron outlining this idea of a European political community where countries could join and they would not be full members of the EU straight away, but in some other kind of structure. Let's take a listen. It's our historical obligation to tackle this today. The creation of what I refer to as a European political community. This new European organization would allow European democratic nations with our core common values to find a new political space. Sophie and Tafel, what, what do you think about this idea of uh, a uh, confederation uh, uh, political community? Well, I mean, in, in a way, you know, we already have multi-speed Europe mm. uh, and, and we have all sorts of, uh, of, of, of cooperation agreements with uh, surrounding countries. Um, I think for what is important here is that if we have such a community, it should, for countries that want to join the European Union, it should be sort of like a first step, a first st stage in the whole process. And I think we should also not forget, when we're talking about Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, in, through the association agreement, has already taken a number of steps, uh, you know, which also are the same steps they should take if they want to become a member. If we look at the countries in the Western Balkans, they have already implemented uh, a series of reforms that they have to uh, implement anyway. But they have to, at some point, you have to, to also make people feel we're not going to, to keep you on a leash forever. Uh, there is, has to be a real prospect. And I think what is extremely important politically, psychologically is that no matter how long the whole process will take we will have to declare now that those countries uh, will be a, con a candidate country we ha we need an overall strategy for the countries that so in other words psychologically you don't think those countries for example in the western balkans are going to be swayed by the idea that they can join a confederation rather than the european well, well, union well that's that's you know it's for them to decide but they want to to join the european union i yeah. think they have already signaled that a long time ago the problem is can can i finish my thought because sorry. i think the problem is we we kept them waiting for very long uh, the, the reform process stalled and now we see that they are actually they're turning to Russia, they're turning to China and Russia and China are using the Western Balkans as a kind of stronghold within the European Union. I find that extremely risky. On that point? In the European, we have also to, to underline that in the European um, uh, process for making law, we have a huge issue. It's in, in the Council we need the unanimity for some important decision and this means veto right for some countries. And we have a huge problem in the, Euro in the EU 27 member states, for example, with Poland and Hungary. 
with the rule of law, uh, the respect of democracy. And I think that, of course, the war in Ru uh, the Russia in Ukraine uh, is now uh, the, the, the most important issue to, to read. And we, we, we forget a little bit that. And in the future, we have to first, first of any enlargement, we have to change our rule and to abandon the unanimity. It's for that reason that we have a conference for the future of Europe, and I think that we have to change our rules before the future enlargement. Just a response on that point. Would you be in favour of getting rid of national vetoes oh, uh, in a Europe of 37 members? We've been, call members we've been calling that for decades. It's, a, it's, it's really, it's a killer. Huh? The veto is, I mean, you see with Orban, uh, it, it gives him extraordinary powers. Not because he's so big, but because he has a veto and he uses it to, to basically blackmail uh, the European Union, to extort money. Um, uh, so the veto should be, should be abolished immediately. It doesn't lead to more power for the citizens. It only leads to horse trading and corruption. But I also think we should, we should keep in mind, why are we doing this? It's not just for the Ukrainians at this moment, but let's say, what will the world look like 20 years from now? The, the, there are massive geopolitical shifts going on. Russia will still be our neighbor. We'll still, you know, now, now there, there is a war going on, but there will also be a, an after war. And then we will need a good relationship with Russia, but also with the United States, with China, and only a strong and big Europe, which doesn't have a kind of unstable neighborhood, will be able to assert itself and to also promote and defend our values and our way of life in the world. We'll have to stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, that's the end of uh, this uh, part of Talking Europe. I'd like to thank my guests, Sophie Innertfeld and Mark Tarabella. Thanks for watching.